Hello everyone and welcome to the first section in .NET interview question preparation series. Uh, in this section, we'll try to cover important questions around IL code, JIT, CLR, CTS and code access security that is SAS. Also, let me put a scope around, you know, what I'm going to cover uh, in this video. So this video will not be demonstrating practicals. You know, this video will not talk about, you know, how to go and implement IL code or how, how does it look like, right? Uh, already we have uh, videos you know which actually cover the practical aspect of IL code, CLR, CTS, JIT. So do go into .NET fundamental section so you can see uh, we have like you know five great videos here which talks about what is IL code, CLR, CLS, JIT. It talks about code access security. It talks about you know what are the changes made in code access security. So if you want to see practically all these things you know you can go and see these videos over here. But here my scope is more from interview aspect. So here we will be looking into more like what kind of questions can come around this section, you know, what kind of answers the interviewer expects and what kind of scenarios can come during the interviews. So this is more of a revision video. So in case you are interested in the practical demonstration video step by step, please go and see that uh, section what I've just shown. But you know, when you're talking about quick revision, you know, this is the video for you. Now, this section that is IL code, CLR, CTS, code access security, they look very basic. But please note that you know you are either a junior you're either a senior right if you are not able to answer questions around these sections the interviewer actually feels very uh, uncomfortable about it and you would be surprised you know that a lot of time you know people and i'm talking about not i'm not talking about people who are with less experience but people who are seniors you know they are not able to answer questions around this and also i've seen a lot of time you know people answering giving definitions of cls in cts and giving definitions of cts in cls so let's try to go and quickly revise, you know, what kind of questions are asked around these sections and how to answer them. So the first question, you know, which definitely comes up is, what is IL code? And, uh, you know, a lot of people just answer full forms, you know, saying that IL code means intermediate language code. Now, one thing we need to remember that when people ask you question, you know, what is WCF, you know, don't answer just full forms. You need to really go in depth and talk about that topic, right? So when people ask like, what is IL code, I've seen, you know, people just saying IL code means intermediate language and that's it. But that does not give a good impression to the interviewer, right? So in one line, what is IL code? IL code is nothing but it's a partially compiled code or a half compiled code, I'll say. So now the next question, you know, what the interviewer can ask here is, so why is this IL code half compiled and it is not fully compiled? So when we talk about compiling, what happens is you have a source code here. Now the source code is in C sharp, probably it is in C++, whatever it is. And then there is a compiler who actually goes and converts this source code into a machine language. Remember that your computer understands only machine language. Now, when he compiles this code into the machine language, you know, he takes various parameters while compiling. For example, what is the operating system for which this compilation should happen? What is the hardware and different other configurations? Now, think about a scenario, you know, where you have compiled a C-sharp code in Windows 7 operating system. Now, as per that scenario, as per that instance, you know, you know, the Windows 7 operating system properties is taken. That particular hardware where this Windows 7 is running, that hardware properties are taken and optimal code is compiled as per that environment. Now, you take this compiled code and if you try to run it in Windows 2008 server or probably if you try to run it in Windows 8 operating system, it will run. Okay, let me again answer. It will run, but it will not optimally run. It will not run with you know, that uh, performance benefits, you know, where it runs under Windows 7. So in .NET, what they have done is, you know, you write a code in C Sharp or in VB.NET, the compiler goes and converts this code into a half compiled format called as IL code. And during runtime, you know, there is one more entity called as the just-in-time compiler. So this just-in-time compiler, he comes in, he goes and he takes all these inputs, like what is the operating system, what is the hardware, you know, what is the configuration. And depending on these uh, properties, right, he goes and he compiles the optimal code for that moment. So in other words, why is IL code half compiled and not fully compiled so that during runtime, the compiler can figure out, you know, what is the operating system, you know, what is the hardware and compile the optimal machine language as per that environment. So summarizing, you know, what you need to answer to the interviewer, IL code is half compiled so that, you know, during runtime, the compiler can figure out, you know, what is the operating system, you know, what are the hardware configuration and it can compile an optimal code as per that environment.
Now, one of the connected question which comes around IL code is, so who compiles this IL code to machine language? So this answer is very easy. It is done by somebody called a JIT. JIT full form is just in time compiler. And one more question, you know, which can follow after JIT is, so how does this JIT compile? Does it compile line by line or does it compile per file or per method? How it is? Now, uh, JIT compiles the code in three ways. One is per file, other one is per method or function, and the last one is code fragment. And all of these three ways is all dependent on JIT. We cannot control from outside saying that, okay, now go and compile only this method. That will depend completely on JIT. He will take his own decision, you know, depending on how the application is running. So per file means here he will take the complete C sharp file and, com and compile it to a machine language. Okay. Second one is per method. So here he will take some method or a function and compile only that method and function uh, and save that compile code into in memory. And last one is code fragment, you know, where probably he can go and take three or four lines of code and compile that code into machine language. So how does, how does the JIT compile uh, to machine language? He can do it file wise. He can do it method wise or he can do it code fragment wise. Now, there is one more rare question, you know, which comes around JIT. And I personally feel that, you know, this question does not test anyone's .NET knowledge. But at the end of the day, you know, the question comes in. So let's try to answer this question. What are the different types of JIT uh, that is available in .NET? So there are three types of JIT which is available in .NET. And uh, these JITs, you know, can be categorized, you know, depending on the way they compile and the way they do caching. In normal JIT, uh, basically, the compilation is done on demand basis. So, for example, let's say you have method one, then only method one will be compiled, you know, in case it is needed. Okay. And once this method one is compiled, you know, the compiled code is stored into cache, that is into RAM. In EchnoJIT, it's the same as the normal JIT. In, in other words, here also the compilation is on demand basis, but, you know, the compiled code is not stored into cache. Okay, or not stored into RAM. So in EchnoJet, you know, in case you have low memory or if you don't have a lot of RAM, for example, look at mobile phones, then this EchnoJet would be a better uh, thing to use. Okay. So in normal JIT and EchnoJet, the difference is only that one guy actually stores the compiled code into cache and the other guy does not. And finally, there is something called as pre-JIT. In pre-JIT, you know, there is no dynamic compilation. There is full compilation. And this full compilation is done by this engine.exe. So you go and run engine.exe and then engine.exe will go and compile your complete .NET code into full machine language at that moment itself. So this is like a full compilation, you know, rather than the half compilation. So let's once again revise the answer, you know, what you will say to the interviewer. So what are the different types of JIT? There are three types of JIT. One is a normal JIT, Echno JIT and Pre-JIT. Normal JIT, you know, does dynamic compilation and stores in memory. Echno JIT does dynamic compilation but does not store in memory. And pre-JIT does full compilation by using engine.exe. Now, one more connected question, you know, around this rare JIT question which comes is, so how can I force, you know, my compiler to use a Echno JIT or a normal JIT? The first thing is you cannot. It is internally decided by the compiler. So to use a normal JIT or to use a Echno JIT is all internal. Now, let's say, you know, for example, let's say you are using some Windows powered device, Windows C powered device or a mobile device, you know, where there is a memory crunch, you know, there is a RAM crunch, then he will switch from normal JIT to Echno JIT. So first thing is by default, he will try to use the normal JIT. But in case he finds that, you know, there is a lot of memory crunch, he will try to use the normal JIT. And for pre-JIT, yes, for pre-JIT, you can make a choice. You can go and use this engine.exe and you can compile uh, your code into full machine code at that moment itself. So pre-JIT you can implement by using engine.exe but uh, EchnoJIT and normal JIT is all uh, internally decided by the .NET compiler itself.